everyone. This is the last uh, talk of this incredible weekend, and it is, as Hans Ulrich said before, a great segue into an afternoon full of exhibitions and art. I'm very honored to be here with uh, Dieter Schwartz and Hans Ulrich Obris to speak about Richter's relationship to the Engadine. As many of you might know or might have already seen, um, there is an exhibition in three parts taking place concurrently at the Nietzsche House in Sils, the Segantini Museum in St. Moritz, and at Hauser in, Wirt in St. Moritz that highlights um, Richter's deep connection to the alpine landscape here in the Engadine. It is um, the first overview exhibition um, about this topic. It was curated by Dieter Schwartz, um, who was able to assemble over 70 works testifying um, to Richter's engagement with the landscape here. Um, the 70 works on view across these three locations um, include paintings, overpainted photographs, sculptures and photographs, and they date from 1989 to 2018. So it's a really very, very special exhibition that is very much connected to the place um, we find ourselves in today. And learning from Hans Ulrich's talk with um, Simon Fatal just before, I'd like to begin at the very beginning, that is in 1989. So I want to ask you, Dieter, um, how did Richter first come to the Engadine in 1989, and what did this first visit bring about? Well, um, I had in 1988 just made the first uh, retrospective mid-career show for Isa Gensken, who was then Gerhard Richter's wife. And in the winter of 88, 89, Isa called me and said, do you know a nice place for us to stay in the winter? And I had just been before in Sils Maria several times and said, yes, I know a place, I know a hotel, and go there. And they went there in the beginning of 89, and they liked it so much that they, and afterwards Gerhard with his new family, returned there in the winter and in the summer. And then a number of works happened. I have to say, I never went up there to see them on vacation because I wanted to respect Richter's privacy, his family life there. But um, anyway, his works from the Engadine are not about anecdotes or about stories from the Engadine. Richter's life is not so much a life of stories, it's a life of work. I just remember one thing that in the summer once, in the 2000s, he made a day trip from Sils to Winterthur because he wanted to show his daughter Ella the paintings hanging in the museum. And on the way in the train, he made this snapshot of his daughter reading, which afterwards he painted as the portrait of Ella, which is still with him in the family. So this so, so much to the, um, to the anecdotes. The only one, the other one would be the, the purchase of the painting uh, Waterfall for the museum, but that's another story. Thank you, Dieter. Um, so we owe it to you that this whole body of work exists and that Dieter discovered um, Sills and the Waldhaus in Sills. After 1989, which marks the beginning of Richter's Engadine works, the next really, really crucial year is 1992, when you, Hans Ulrich, um, curated an exhibition of Richter's work at Nietzsche House in Sills. So that was a very special project and I'm very curious to learn from you firsthand how this project came into being, um, what the main impetus was for it, and what the exhibition consisted of. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Actually, it began um, really with a studio visit I made with Gerhard when I was 17, I was a teenager. I went to his opening, um, 17, 18, yeah, I went to his opening in Bern. It was a show at the Kunsthalle Bern and um, a retrospective, and I asked him if I could visit the studio, and we met the week after in Cologne, and he was sort of, um, there that somehow in the later part of the 80s that these overpainted photographs, it only became intenser in 89, but sort of in 86, 7, 8, there started to be some, you know, in the studio. And of course, you had them always also in the Atlas. Um, and uh, we, we started to have conversations and sort of in tandem with that, I started to kind of organize my first exhibition. No, I, the first one was in the kitchen in St. Gallen in my student apartment with Fischli Weiss and others. And, um, it's a show which lasted for three months and had only 29 visitors, but it kind of became a rumor. And, um, and then 
Yeah, then I did a show with Christian Boltanski in the monastery library in St. Gallen. So the idea was to kind of do exhibitions where one expects it leaves, no, in unexpected locations. So it was already a little bit of a series. And then uh, when Dieter got him enthusiastic about the Engadin, uh, he once told me that he's in the Waldhaus and if I wanted to visit. So I took the train and um, we visited that day the Nietzsche house together. And I kind of told him, you know, that I had done this show in, in the monastery library and could one do an exhibition. And he somehow really loved the Nietzsche house, but immediately was very skeptical as he mostly always is when one proposes him a project. No, the sort of principle of doubt is always there and he questioned it and sort of said, why would one disturb this wonderful house museum? You know, why would one? And then we said, yeah, maybe it could actually be very discreet, you know, the show could just be in the interstices, so uh, visitors could visit the Nietzsche house, but then, you know, in the vitrines, there could be some photographs. And then that sort of made him more comfortable. He thought, you know, then you just have a very few of these, these overpainted photographs, but from the beginning, there was this idea of the sphere, you know, the kugel, uh, which now you brilliantly connect the three venues with. I thought it was an excellent curatorial idea, a very beautiful idea that these three shows are connected through this mirroring sphere. And uh, he actually uh, wanted to have that sphere in the room where, 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 where basically Nietzsche wrote Zarathustra. Now, the thing is, I think one of the really least discussed aspects of Richter's work, and it's not only Richter, it's, it's true for, for many artists as well who work with artist books, is the importance of the artist book as a medium. You know, because when artists do artist books, that's as important often as an exhibition. And it's clearly the case with, with, you know, with Richter. Dieter and I both contributed to a book which was published about Richter's books. It's a meta book. So you can see all the artist books you know, he has done in, in that book. And uh, he was always very interested in, in this idea of you know, using the catalog as, a, you know, as an artist book. And that's what he suggested here. So we did this little book with Octagon and he played around with the layout, put some of the photographs upside down, the overpainted photographs, you know, took all the photos of the different mountains around Sils Maria and uh, also left some pauses. So it kind of moves across waves with pauses, with intervals, with silences. And uh, the original layout for this artist book that you mentioned that is called Sils and was published by Octagon is currently on view um, at the gallery in St. Moritz. So 1992 was the year of the exhibition of that artist book, but it was also a year in which Richter made a lot of the works that today belong to this group of Engadin works. So it was a very, very prolific year for Richter with regards to this topic. And I wanted to ask you, Dieter, if you could speak a bit more about the different types of works that belong to this body of work, how they perhaps differ from each other, but also how they overlap and how you structured the exhibition in the three locations around these different mediums. Yes, I mean, Richter did paintings, overpainted photographs, but partic particularly I wanted to start with a work which is not typical, the steel ball which Hans Ulrich just mentioned. And you have to remember that for Richter, I think there are two types of the perfect image, the mirror and the photography. The photography is better known because he has all these paint, photo, uh, uh, paint, paintings after photographs, whereas the mirror is always there also in his work. And he always had this steel ball in the studio rolling around because he was fascinated that this polished steel ball would reflect anything around it. It's the perfect mirror reflecting the whole world. And when he was here in the Engadin, he had this idea of doing, at the moment of Hans Ulrich's exhibition, an edition of steel balls, certain, uh, certain size, and on every one of them, the name of a mountain of the Engadin is engraved. So out of this object becomes a symbol, a kind of a symbol for what he perceived there. And it's not a depiction of nature, but I think what he wanted to, sh uh, to show with this steel ball is that nature, this extremely strong impression he had here, that this nature is throwing you back as strongly as the mirror reflecting steel ball throws you back. It's inaccessible, it's overpresent, but it's also there, it's really outside of us. It's like nature, which is there so strongly, it's outside of us. So this is the steel ball, a copy of which is in each of the three venues of the exhibition. 
Then there are a few paintings. The paintings are going through, the, um, through these years, from 1992, St. Moritz painting, until the 2000s. Altogether, I think there would be 16 paintings with subjects from the Engadine. We have, I think, nine here, which is already something, because a few of them are in Japan or in Seattle, uh, and so far away. So um, I think the, the ones which are here um, show us a little bit of what these uh, paintings of the Engadine are. They're not depicting the tourist Engadine. They're subjects often which are absolutely anonymous. You could even say that the most spectacular landscape paintings Richter did were not done with after subjects from here. They maybe were done after subjects from the Rhineland <laughs> or from places which are not really very attractive altogether. So what he is cho chooses here are places which are maybe not even recognizable. St. Moritz, for instance, or the little house which is near Sills, or the this, 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 this snowscape, etc., etc. We can maybe see some of these images here. Here and we have one of the most maybe <laughs> imposing and romantic ones, yeah. The waterfall. And the waterfall, maybe I, you allow me to say something about the waterfall right now, because that's the painting I could purchase in 1997 for Kunstmuseum Winter Tour. And it was a wonderful moment because at that time I was often staying overnight at the studio and I was literally sleeping at the scaffold, near the scaffold where this painting was. And I said the next morning, this is the painting for a Swiss museum. I think we should uh, like to purchase this. And Richter said, we'll think about that, we'll see. But then it happened and so I'm very happy that this painting got here. Now this painting is like presenting flourishing nature at the first sight. But then you have to remember, it's a photograph of a, of a situation in the effect style. And the photograph then has been portrayed on canvas. And then it has been blurred, so it's completely flat. It's not what you see in nature, it's something else. It's a painting. And as Richter quite rightly remarked, the sheen of nature, the appearance of nature in the painting is between us and nature. So it's not about direct experience of nature, it's more or less about the loss of nature, about the loss of that reality which we don't have anymore when we see the painting. So it's a very ambivalent, very ambiguous painting about this landscape. And I think that's the basic truth about all these Engadine works. I stop now. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Dieter. Um, so maybe to trace back for a moment, Richter came first in 1989. He kept coming back in both summer and winter time. And as you mentioned, an important part of this body of works are his um, figurative paintings. So while vacationing here, he used to take a lot of pictures or maybe photographed constantly and then selected part of these photographs to paint them. But with another part, um, here we see an abstract painting that is on at on view at Segantini Museum. Um, with the other part of the photographs, he created these overpainted photographs where he uses most often oil, but sometimes also animal to intervene directly onto the photograph and creates a kind of dialogue between photography and painting, but also figuration and abstraction. And maybe departing from these small-scale overpainted photographs, I want to ask you, Hans Ulrich, what do you feel um, related to but also um, generally is the significance of smaller formats in an artist's body of work? W what significance do they hold, but also what space do they offer um, to an, an artistic practice? Yeah, thank you. So I think it's incredibly important that these, you know, small works which are really they have the format of photo snapshots, no? In the pre-digital age, that's how we, you know, developed photographs. And the, uh, on these snapshots, he basically um, really brought together his abstract work and his photo paintings all in one. And uh, there are, of course, so many different, you know, varieties and possibilities. And some of them, the very early ones, you have the drops, no? Because he basically just put a few drops of color on the photograph to kind of test so that he could then paint it. So it was basically a tool. It wasn't, and then he kind of liked it and started to artificially do that. Then he started to overpaint them, as you said, with the rake, you know, after the, very often at the end of the day. Um, then he started to make like entire series, like the museum series he made, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in a, in a way, you know, it became this very, very substantial body of work, which for him as is, as is, is as important, I would say, as, um, as bigger paintings. They're not, you know, 
They're not works which are sort of studies. They're really works in their, in their own right. Uh, and I think the, the idea, you know, if you look at art history very often, um, and of course, in art history, you also have a lot of artists who use photography in that, in that way. I mean, Degas experimented early on with photography, so did Delacroix. Um, but also a lot of artists worked with these intimate formats. I mean, I remember um, one of the sort of first times I became aware of that was reading the biography of Félix Fénéant, who was, of course, a close friend of Georges Seurat. And Fénéant would always, when he travels, you know, carry a painting which Seurat had made, which is portable, you know, and install it in hotel rooms and in venues where he would visit. So he would never, never be anywhere, you know, without installing this painting. So it becomes a kind of a, a portable museum. And that sort of inspired me more or less at the same time when we did this, um, when we did this exhibition and we stayed for two weeks with Richter when we installed at the, at the Waldhaus. And we, you know, we played chess every day. The kind of a Duchamp element. We saw a picture of that. Yes, before, and then, yeah? uh, and then I, you know, I had this little frame because I wanted to do a portable museum to kind of pursue or, or continue this Felix Fennel idea of the portable museum. And I went to see Hans Peter Fellmann, the late uh, German artist who had a store in Düsseldorf. You know, he stopped making art and had this store. So I went to his store and bought a little frame, which is two by three inches. Uh, and I basically asked artists to do exhibitions in that portable frame. And I would carry the frame wherever I went. You know, I would show it to you know, to people in the bus, in the subway. I would show it to people when we were in restaurants, in, in hotels. You know, it became this kind of portable museum. And actually, whilst we installed the show um, at the Nietzsche Museum, Richter also did an exhibition for this portable little, you know, little museum. And I think, I mean, of course, there is a long history in many different, you know, cultures and many different art histories of small formats. I mean, it's interesting. Whilst we talked this morning uh, with Simon, you know, preparing the talk, I was actually rereading Simon's extraordinary text on, on Etel Adnan's painting. And um, Simon describes how Etel worked in Simon's studio for a few years, soon after they met in Beirut in 72. Um, and Simon had a large studio, so, you know, um, there was space for Etel to work there and freedom. And here is a quote which brings us back to this idea of small formats. Um, Simon writes, the first time Etel used it was to draw a tree in watercolors. This flowering tree was a revelation. I looked at it for a long time. It had a lot in common, it had a lot in common with the world of Arab miniatures. It stood on the page diagonally, its flowers freshly shivering in the outside air, its colors unobtrusive and discreet, almost shy, a young tree. So I do think you know, that this idea of small formats is, is important that very often now because we have such big new museum spaces, I think it's a problem, you know, very often that um, there is not really space in these very big museum spaces, which is why it's interesting that in 19th century museums, you very often have more intimate spaces and you have bigger spaces, and which is why I also thought it was very interesting always to make, you know, exhibition in house museums, like the Sir John Soane's house or the Paragon house or the Walker house. Or the um, one at Nietzsche House that you did. Yeah. May I just add something about this? Because it's really, in a, in a way, it's atypical because Richter was always considering himself an official painter and not an artist for small sizes. And for instance, when I, in the 90s, asked him, proposed to him to do a show of his drawings, he said, do you really think that's interesting? Well, go along, do it. But I think the painting is the really important thing the official painting, which has a form, a size, etc., etc., which can be in a show. And so I think it was the advantage of Hans Ulrich's Nietzsche House show that he brought out these overpainted photographs, which had not been out before. It was a, pl a remote place, not the official area where usually he was showing in his galleries or in museums. And also, I think what's this to say about them? Um, it has a lot to do with the studio practice that, in fact, it was not planned to do these works, but. It came about because for the photos, to paint the photos, he always used dabs of color just to find the right tones to, uh, to portray the photographs. And then he found out that putting an oil mark on a photo is interesting by itself because two different languages are coming together, depict the depicting reality of the photo and the matter, the pure matter of oil paint, and that the two languages could interfere with each other, they could complement each other, they could deny each other, and there, there's, there are various relationships of these two levels of pictorial language, and so a whole body of work came about, which was for a long time undercover. It was mostly shown in small galleries, not the official ones, so, but then now it's thousands of such works. 
Thank you so much, Dieter. Um, we heard before during your talk uh, with Simone Fatal that Simone will go to Sils and to Nietzsche House. Um, and the title of our talk here today is Ever Sills. So I want to ask the both of you, um, when you think about the Engadine and artists who have spent time here, who are figures that you feel have uh, been in meaningful dialogue with the place and the landscape, but also why do you feel um, this specific valley has inspired so many writers, thinkers, uh, musicians, and artists? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting also that uh, it's, a, it's a big question. Yeah, it's interesting that the exhibition, of course, also happens in the Segantini Museum. And of course, Segantini, I mean, Nita, I'm sure we'd say more about that, is of course a key example of an artist, you know, who not only came to the Engadine, but then went higher and higher and actually, you know, did his very last works, not in the valley, but really literally on the mountains. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons is certainly also this, um, that it's not only artists, that it's in a way uh, philosophers, it thinkers, um, it's, um, I mean, I remember when we were with Richter at the Waldhaus, there were evenings where we would sort of have dinner with Alexander Kluge and then also Habermas would be there. So it's, it's a very, um, it's an incredible situation which has historically always attracted, you know, philosophers, writers, poets who sort of get ideas here, uh, can also write here. Um, and of course, Alexander Kluge comes here every year from, you know, between Christmas and New Year. And that's actually also something which probably one day should happen. There should at some point be a project about Alexander Kluge and the Engadine, you know. And he, of course, also worked with Richter on, um, on a book where Richter showed photographs from a walk and then, you know, Kluge did, uh, did texts. And uh, my partner, Ku the artist, has always also said that she just can easily draw here. Whenever we were in the Engadine, you know, she makes a lot of drawings. Why this is actually the case is, is complex to say. Maybe it has to do, you know, also with the fact that it's so high up. Maybe it has to, I think it has also got to do with the fact that the light of the north and the south somehow, you know, meet. I remember also when I came here first um, in, in the early 90s, the, the late German artist Emil Schumacher was here from the, in, the generation before Richter, you know, the sort of informal, uh, movement, so a lot of a lot of artists, and it never stopped in a way. Yeah, Thank and of course now Simon Fatal is going to see Maria. <laughs> and of course, Dieter, your show, in a way, by being in three location, also connects Richter's Engadine works to um, other artists or thinkers, philosophers who have spent time here. So on the one hand, as Hans Ulrich mentioned, Giovanni Segantini. On the other hand, Friedrich Nietzsche. So by structuring your show in three locations, you also embedded Richter and his work in this context. Yes, indeed, it's a coincidence. It's not something I chose. And I was quite unsure how Segantini and Richter would behave together in one gallery. This was not, not, uh, I was not so sure about it in the beginning, but now it seems visually to work. But uh, it's also, it's interesting in particular because of the country, because they're so contrarian, they're, they're um, they, they have such a different base. The Segantini is this enthusiasm for light and inventing a technique to translate the light uh, onto, a, onto a canvas. And with Richter, it's not a technique. With Richter, it's always a method. And when uh, Segantini has this immediacy of experience, which he transmits on the, on the canvas, for Richter, it's exactly the contrary. It's not the immediacy. It's the loss. It's the denial of the immediacy and so on. So I think because they're so far from each other, I think they can be in one space. And with Nietzsche, I mean, Richter's not a philosopher. He would never dare make comments on Nietzsche, but I think there's something interesting happening there because when you look at the late Nietzsche, and I'm not a philosopher myself, I have to say, but I found still some reflections, and one of them is this kind of this, this disenchantment of the world, and Nietzsche even, um, has this word of the Entmenschlichung der Natur, the dehumanization of nature, which has to do with Sils Maria, with the mountains. Maybe that's also what the steel ball of Richter communicates. And uh, in confronted, being confronted with this, this human dehumanization of nature, I think there's only aesthetic comfort. There's aesthetic and form 
are possibilities to encounter these and to, re uh, to respond to these. And I think that's where it comes in, and that's, I think, where the two are not a couple, not a pair, but I think where they have a moment of approach. Yeah, I think you both, in a way, said something very similar and very interesting that this valley um, is so fruitful also because creatives from such different backgrounds meet here, right? From Nietzsche to Alexander Kluge, Gerhard Richter, etc. So there is also a space for people from dis different disciplines, which of course is something that we witness here at Engadin Art Talks very much as well. Um, it has been really wonderful to speak to the both of you about um, Richter and the Engadin. I mean, you're both uh, brilliant curators who have worked with him on numerous occasions. And I want to take um, this moment to perhaps look into the future. Um, Dieter, I think it is official now, and I can mention it, that you'll be co-curating Richter's big retrospective at Fondation Louis Vuitton in 226. So that's certainly a big project on your horizon. Are you able to say a few words about that? Well, the Fondation Louis Vuitton wanted to proposed to do a Richter exhibition. It's a, it's, it was a year ago for the October of 2025. And when I asked uh, Richter about who should do this, he mentioned two names, Nick Serotto, ex-head of the Tate, and myself. And so Nick and I are now the British Swiss Dream Team to do this exhibition. And it's wonderful to work together, really, I have to say. We had last year to put together a checklist. And I think we'll have the chance, after so many important Museum Richter retrospectives, for once to do a show which goes from painting number one until the last painting, because the last painting was done in 2017. And it's exceptional that with all artists alive and hopefully still alive in 2025, uh, that you can show really, a, give a survey of the whole painted oeuvre. And of course, there will be sculpture, there will be works on paper and so on and so on. And after that, the wonderful show, The Metropolitan, which I happily attended at the opening, had to close 10 days later because of COVID. This is really important that now Richter again has a chance to live a, a really large show of, of his work. So it's October 25, it's very, very soon already, and I hope we bring together the greatest hits. Thank you, Dieter, we certainly look forward. And I also heard that you, Hans Ulrich, um, have something cooking. Can you tell us anything about it? Yeah, my most recent uh, collaboration with Richter is that that has just come out. It's, you know, we've done uh, with Henny a little book of um, uh, these, all these post-it notes, which I also publish on Instagram, like handwritten notes by artists. And um, Gerhard Richter's contribution is this uh, sentence he, he wrote, uh, he hand-wrote that art is the highest form of hope. And, um, and then, of course, there is a project which, is, which we're working on now, which is slightly too early to announce, but it has to do with, in a very interesting way, it is actually connected um, also to something Simon is working on right now, because it's this idea of, um, you know, often artists have unrealized projects, maybe um, outside art, which are maybe also architectural, and uh, Simon is at the moment realizing uh, the unrealized project of Etel Adnan. We spoke a lot with Etel about that, and Etel wanted actually to be an architect. That was her initial idea. It was an unrealized project. So she wanted to build a house, so we asked her to actually, on millimeter paper, really define how this house would work. Um, and Simone is now building this house and working on it uh, in Lebanon, uh, which uh, hopefully in a few years, you know, we can all visit. And Gerhard has also this very big interest, of course, in, you know, going beyond exhibitions. And so we work on something which is sort of a, almost architectural sculpture, maybe, and to be announced soon. Can't wait. Thank you so much. Maybe we can uh, see if the public has questions. Grace, does someone come with the microphone or? Thank you so much. This is so amazing. I saw the show and this conversation, you modeled it so well and these two minds connect so many dots for me and also open so many questions, but I can also I can only ask one. So this question comes from the angle, like as two curators, you both worked very in depth with uh, some artists. So Dieter said the two things when I saw the show, I actually thought about it. First is about you mentioned like how Hans Rich by um, 
this show in Nietzsche House, how it changed uh, Richard's certain views to look at art, how it opened this. I, I, to me, this opened a huge field because this show is small. When I saw the show, I wrote to Hans Rich, it touched something so fundamental, this, ang this part I haven't seen Richter because to me, it touched the relationship between human and, uh, and the nature and then the reality and the imagination. And it made me think a lot about the bow work and the, the mirror work. But my question actually is from the Nietzsche house, um, when you create the show and it was your idea to propose and Dieter said actually Richter was not a philosopher. He didn't think about the relationship with Nietzsche. But then you see, at the end, you see this relationship. And from a lot of my reading and understanding, Nietzsche has had this profound impact to so many artists. And I actually thought I should write a book about it. Some people talked about openly, like Roscoe. So curating is a, is a job that's, the history is not so long in art history. So for you too, when you work with artists so in depth, do you feel somehow some of your dynamic, actually part of it, somehow it has it has some artistic, it has something beyond the, the intellect, like intuition, uh, that is kind of curation that can influence your artists. That's the question. Thank you, Grace. Um, I mean, basically, if we take this show you know, from 92 um, as an example, it's, it's kind of a lot to do with my methodology that, in a way, you know, there isn't really often a master plan. Things evolve um, out of serendipity, maybe, you no? Know? And so this show really just happened, you know, as, I mean, Whistler said, art happens, we can say exhibitions happen. And it kind of grew out of life, it grew out of conversations, it grew out of being together, of spending time, right? And so we, you know, we would have a studio visit, he would invite me to visit him in Sils Maria, we would play chess, we would visit the house together. You know, and very spontaneously, we talked about this idea of doing these shows, it wasn't like something we planned, and then we would talk to Mr. Bloch, and he thinks it's a good idea. You know, so in a way, you know, it was very organic. And, um, and that's how it happens to a lot of to a lot of my projects. I would say that they kind of develop, you know, in, in that in that kind of way. They, they, it's almost like you know, it's not something you're planning now to do a show here or there. It, it, uh, then you know, it comes comes out of a necessity, comes out of a dialogue, and very often has to do also with you know, just listening to artists. This idea to listen, I think, is important. I, I can only agree that this is really something which has to develop. Maybe you have an idea as a curator and you approach the artist, but then you start learning. Maybe your idea will become more precise, maybe it will change, but it's, uh, it's really a work in progress. And now, we, uh, Hans Ulrich had the chance to work at the Nietzsche House with Richter. Now he's too old and didn't come. I had the challenge to do it myself and I had to find an idea. And also when I was invited to do this show. I did not know yet how it would be distributed, how it will be organized, how it will be, what, will, what really would be shown. And for the Nietzsche House, then I had an idea which hopefully will work, but it also, it all had to come together in the end. 